afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to the first event of the Water Day at the World Bank Group Pavilion in Sharm El Sheikh or at the COP27. My name is Saroj Kumar Jha. I am the World Bank's Global Director for Water Global Practice. I'm, I'm really very pleased to be moderating this session, but let me say a few words uh, about the World Bank's work in water. World Bank is uh, one of the largest financiers of water sector programs around the world. We currently have an active portfolio of close to $30 billion of projects, both in low-income countries and middle-income countries. These projects are essentially helping the governments to increase the access to safe water supply and sanitation, manage water resources better, and increasingly help governments to really move towards more green water sector, both in terms of production, distribution, and uh, management of water resources. The, in today's session, we have uh, a very distinguished lineup of speakers. We have uh, three speakers connected online uh, remotely, and I want to thank all of them for connecting, especially our uh, speaker from Colombia, because it is very early in Colombia now. So I really want to thank you all for joining. And in here in the panel here, I have two very distinguished speakers. I will introduce them as we go through the day. I want to first begin by a presentation by my colleague, Eileen Burke, who is the global lead for water resource management in my department. And she'll be presenting briefly an upcoming report on water storage. Since the theme of this session, first session, is sustainable storage and river basin management, essentially as a way of building a more resilient water sector to climate change, I think it is in the fitness of things to have a brief presentation of the report, and then we will go through the panel discussion. Sorry that I can't be with you today, but I hope today is the beginning of a much longer conversation about how we can manage our water storage differently as a tool for climate mitigation, adaptation, and greater sustainable development. As I'm sure you've heard many times this week already, climate change manifests itself through the water cycle. It's making rainfall more variable with increasing intensity and increasing periods of floods and drought, all at the same time, increasing uncertainty. Rising temperatures are increasing demands for water, for cooling, for agriculture, and to sustain life as we know it. These fundamental changes to our water supplies and demands mean that many will need to change the way they manage water in order to make sure that there's adequate water for, for firms, farms, and families. For millennia, humankind has used water storage as a central tool to manage water. Water storage in the form of small tanks or reservoirs has enabled civilizations to store extra water in periods of abundance, to lessen the impacts of floods, to make water available in dry periods, and to increase certainty around water. Societies have also harnessed water storage to produce energy and to regulate flows for downstream uses such as navigation. Water storage has been an an enabler of economic growth and of human well being. Water storage is a unique tool that can be used to both adapt and mitigate climate change, to reduce risks of floods and droughts, while also generating hydropower. In addition, it can be used to integrate other variable renewable energy sources, such as solar and wind, into the grid and provide energy storage through pumped hydro. While we need more water storage to cope with climate change, globally, we're headed in the wrong direction. Per capita built water storage is declining due to lack of maintenance of our existing dams and reservoirs and high rates of sedimentation, along with a decreasing pace of construction of large water storage. Natural forms of water storage are also decreasing as floodplains and wetlands are being developed as glaciers and snowpack melt with global warming. EMI and GWP have dubbed this growing space 
between the existing water storage and the need for it as the water storage gap. And this water storage gap is only projected to increase as we move forward. As water storage grows in importance, global methods for developing and managing it are growing more inadequate. In general, the overall approaches to water storage have been too fragmented and short term to add up to the more comprehensive, sustainable, and integrated solutions that current circumstances demand. New approaches are needed to fill the storage gap. Recognizing the need for global attention to water storage as a tool for climate mitigation and adaptation and as an enabler for growth, the World Bank will be launching a new report on December 5th, what the future has in store, a new paradigm for water storage. Climate change demands smarter approaches and tools to make long-term investments in natural and built infrastructure and in the institutions to manage it. The report calls on us to think differently, plan inclusively, and act systematically to address the water storage challenges in the coming age. Grounded in the principles of integrated water resource management, it provides a framework for accelerating collaboration between sectors and public and private stakeholders globally, setting out a strategy for tackling and overcoming the storage gap, and tables an imperative for the whole spectrum of vested water stakeholders to begin championing integrated water storage solutions managed as a system to provide long-term, resilient, and sustainable services that benefit many generations to come. We invite you to join us on December 5th to learn more about what the future has in store and how you can work to implement the new paradigm for water storage for climate adaptation and mitigation and broader sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eileen. And uh, as she said that this report is being launched in December, and we really hope that this World Bank report will help the governments to make decisions on both soft and hard infrastructure solutions for increasing the storage, which helps with better water supply, more reliable irrigation for food security, and also, of course, increasing renewables in the overall energy mix in the countries where we work. So the World Bank stands ready to help governments work on the storage agenda. With that, I would like to move to our first speaker of the session, and I'll turn to Delhi now. Uh, I'm, we are very honored to be joined by Ms. Debashree Mukherjee, Special Secretary, Ministry of Water Resources, uh, River Basin Development, and Ganga Rejuvenation. That's the name of the ministry. She has a very important responsibility. Uh, Debashree has, of course, a very accomplished track record in the Indian government. Prior to this, she, have, she was the CEO of Delhi Jal Board and CEO of Delhi Transport Corporation as well. Those of you from the region, you would know these are two very big state-owned enterprises, and a lot depends on the efficiency of these two organizations. So, Devashri, over to you, and I guess you'll be speaking on dams in the story. Yes. Over to you. Thank you so much. And good morning to everybody. Am I audible? Yes. Right. So good morning and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak briefly and in part about India's uh, story in terms of water management, managing storage more sustainably. Um, as Eileen has said already, we know that climate change affects the water cycle. We are already experiencing this. We're already seeing evidence of this. We are seeing longer dry spells. We are seeing more extreme precipitation events in India, and we are grappling with this. And while the overall water availability has not changed significantly, um, these extreme events are making are creating new challenges in terms of water management. So we know how critical it is to take action immediately to mitigate this, these impacts. Now, we are also cognizant that this, the effect of these change in water cycles is much more disproportionately more on the poorest and the most vulnerable. So everything that we do has to take that into account. India's focus has been on increasing storage, both 
above the surface, but also underground. So we're looking at surface water storage and we're also looking at groundwater. And I'll speak at some length about groundwater because our groundwater story, which a groundwater has created enormous opportunities for us, but there are also huge challenges in terms of sustainability. Our focus is also on optimizing utilization and managing the available storage more efficiently. Now, India has the third largest number of dams in the world. And uh, so we have, we have two areas of emphasis. We've had two areas of emphasis in the last seven to eight years. Uh, one is on completing our long pending projects. We have this Pradhan Mantri Prishi Sinchai Yojana, which is an integrated program where long pending projects which were stuck for want of resources were picked up and there is focus on, on completing those projects and increasing storage. The second big program, and I think uh, India is now implementing the largest dam rehabilitation and improvement program in the world with the support of the World Bank. Um, we are, uh, the dam rehabilitation and improvement program is is a paradigm change in the management of large dams. We are moving away from the cycle of building dams and then allowing both the infrastructure to deteriorate over time with great focus on operation and maintenance and better management of the storage. So this program in this phase takes on more than 800 dams. Um, there, there is physical rehabilitation, but also better OMM. And as a part of this exercise, we are revisiting the rule curves in every dam in view of change hydrology and also revisiting our emergency action plans in every dam created in consultation with the local community. So disaster risk reduction, as well as looking at the impact of climate change on hydrology and planning forward in terms of better management of the reserves. The big challenge that we have in this program right now is management of sedimentation. And again, Elin flagged that when she spoke. Um, so the, we, we're working out strategies to manage sediments better, which include uh, better improvement of our catchments and better catchment monitoring, and also scientific desenting exercises. Now, learning from what we are doing on dam rehabilitation and improvement, the India has enacted a comprehensive dam safety legislation. This legislation provides the institutional support and the legal heft being able to, you know, better operation and maintenance of our water infrastructure, which includes dams and rivers, reservoirs, and states. And while the dam safety legislation covers large dams, we are working with states to also manage, to also extend this legislation and these processes to the management of the smaller dams. Uh, the other area of uh, emphasis has been on capacities, because I, I think this entire thing about, uh, you know, dam safety and managing of reservoirs is an issue we, we have found that we severely lack capacities. So over the last uh, 10 years, the program, the dam rehabilitation and improvement program has also set up, uh, you know, um, mechanisms to improve capacities in the country, including two prestigious MTech programs, which are being run by the Indian Institute of Science Bangalore and the Indian Institute of Technology, Roorkee. Now I'd like to come to groundwater. And, you know, we recognize the fact that our largest reservoir is under our feet. And therefore, we, and this is frequently invisible. So the focus is on making it visible and recharge and managing the groundwater better. 65% of our, you know, water supply schemes and India is making a big push to ensure access to water, uh, pipe water for every household. But 65% of our rural uh, pipe water schemes are groundwater based. So if we cannot manage our groundwater sustainability, we have a big challenge going forward. Um, the 
the first thing that was done was in 2099, we started what we call the Jal Shakti Abhiyan, which is a national call to action to get everybody involved in groundwater recharge and conservation. So two months, two to three months prior to the rains, to the monsoons, uh, states, communities, civil society act organizations are involved to start desilting water bodies, improving recharge. So really to be ready to catch the rain. We are spending an average of $7 billion a year on this, uh, mostly through convergence, largely funded through our employment guarantee, MG Narega. But the focus is on scientific inputs to try and improve recharge. So every district has prepared a water conservation and recharge plan. We have geotagged and um, we have geotagged and we are monitoring almost 90% of our water bodies. And by the end of December, we should have completed 100% geotagging of water bodies in every district, because if you don't, uh, you know, if you don't monitor your water bodies, they tend to disappear. Um, the, uh, also, we are, we are providing greater focus on management of our springs and spring sheds, particularly in the Himalayan and the Northeastern regions. Uh, afforestation, a huge afforestation effort, particularly in the catchment areas of water bodies and, and rivers and rivulets, is another part of this campaign. Um, I'd also like to talk about the Atal Bhujal Yojana. This is another program that we are implementing in seven states of our country in water scarce districts with the support of the World Bank. This is a paradigm shift in groundwater management. When I spoke about uh, when I spoke about uh, you know the Jal Shakti Abhiyan, this is basically a supply side intervention. Atal Bhujal Yojana is a demand side intervention. We are working here with the village communities to prepare community-owned village water security plans, which look at both demand and supply and help communities to manage their demand sustainably. Ms. Mukherjee, if you could wrap up, please. Yes. I'm sorry yes. to disturb. I just, I just find out. So early days yet, but we are seeing some, you know, some positive signs. So during the last two groundwater assessments, we are actually seeing a reduction in the number of overexploited assessment units and an increase in the number of uh, safe units. And we know that this is not, you know, we have to run to catch up, but uh, but this is slight positive trends coming up, and we are happy about this. Finally, I just mentioned the Namami Gange program, which is our effort at bringing, you know, holistic river basin management, starting with cleaning the river, but then moving on to management of e flows and um, e flows, and also bringing in socioeconomic um, parameters. Now, again, these are first steps. These learnings we would like to use to inform our work in the other basins. But I think we have a long way to go to look at integrated water resource management, basin level planning. And this is where we, we have a major area of focus. I will stop here and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much, Ms. Mukherjee. And I, I really wish that we had more time to go through your presentation, but we are really hard pressed for time. We have uh, speakers and there's a cutoff time here because the next session will also start in about an hour's time. So thank you very much. And uh, India's story in water resource management is clearly very transformational. I know this is work in progress. The World Bank is very, very happy to be associated with India's transformation. And, and as you said, there are so many lessons that we can draw from your experience that would be useful for other countries. So with that, I would like to turn to Nigeria. We are very pleased to have uh, His Excellency Minister Suleiman Adamu with us. He is the Minister for Water Resources and Irrigation since January 2015. He has a, a very accomplished uh, record in working for various organizations, particularly a number of management consultancy in the countries. He's worked in infrastructure projects in health, education, transportation. And uh, more importantly, uh, we hear great things about your work in your current capacity in your country. So we're very pleased to be partnering with you in Nigeria's water resource management story. So, sir, the floor is yours. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Secretary Director. Uh, let me begin by saying uh, that uh, I'm glad that uh, water has become taking a central stage when it comes to climate change issues because of its, uh, uh, you know, impact on, uh, you know, the, I mean, the, it's the vulnerability of any community when it comes to climate change. I think water is the first thing that, uh, that comes to mind. We have drought, we have extreme floods and situations like that. So, uh, unpredictable water availability, I mean, uh, climate change brings unpredictability, unpredictable water availability and also exacerbating water scarcity and contaminating water supplies. And such impacts can drastically affect the quantity and quality of water that is required for survival. Uh, storage of water during the rainy season for multipurpose use for water supply, hydropower, and irrigation is an adaptation mechanism designed to ensure water availability all year round. Uh, and of course, it can be surface or underground through surface or uh, reservoirs or underground reservoirs. Uh, unfortunately, in Nigeria, I have a problem with the two exploitation of the groundwater reservoir because uh, uh, certainly uh, because of failure of uh, water agencies to develop larger municipal schemes or into cost and population growth, we have resorted to exploiting more of our groundwater resource and uh, I'm sure that in the future, this is going to be a very, very serious problem for storage of water, the groundwater resource. Uh, of course, we know the impact of climate change, as I've mentioned, so I uh, don't need to go back to that uh, on our ecosystem. But uh, talking more about Nigeria, water is key. It's a key driver for boosting economic growth and maximizing shared prosperity and achieving water security. And it's going to be of critical importance to us as it has been going into the future with the population continue to grow now at a estimate of about 200 million people uh, so the impact uh, the pressure is on uh, on our current uh, resource we have about 375 million cubic meters per year which is more than six times higher than egypt's annual release from the high s1 dam and the renewable uh, groundwater resource potential is estimated 156 billion cubic meters a year. But the distribution of water around the country is uneven. Uh, some areas in the north have a low precipitation of up from 50 millimeters uh, going further to the south. You can get up to 1,500 millimeters. Uh, but generally with a scarcity index of 1,800 uh, 1, cubic meters per capita, we are not a water poor country as such. But the available water index will continue to decline, to decline with population uh, growth, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we see, uh, you know, water as a security issue. Uh, now and going forward, we had two devastating floods in 2012 and in 2022. Over 600 uh, people died this year. Uh, billions of uh, uh, Naira uh, of property lost and our infrastructure, roads and uh, bridges and so on. Um, so we need to have uh, suitable mitigation measures in place. And uh, just before I came, uh, the president uh, uh, directed me to set up a new, to develop a new comprehensive plan for uh, mitigating flood disasters in the country. We have a plan, but uh, of course it was based were calibrated on the 2012 floods, but the 2022 floods are far more, far much uh, in intensity, and therefore we have to recalibrate. Uh, and one of the things we're talking about to mitigate flood is all this issue of uh, storage, effective storage ma uh, management uh, of water, uh, of the abundant resource that we have. And uh, as you know, as a country, we have over 400 dams and storage reservoirs out of which 180 of them are classified as large dams by the International Committee on Large Dams. Uh, this uh, process started way back in around 1962, between 1962 and 90. Firstly, maybe, I think mainly for hydropower and then during the 1970 droughts, we felt the need uh, to have uh, more storage reservoirs. Uh, unfortunately, I've, over time, it's uh, we have not been able to do more than what we did during the 70s and 80s. 
mainly because also multinational funding agencies like the World Bank actually stop funding this, uh, this kind of projects. But we think that uh, with the plans that we have, that uh, uh, maybe and with this uh, new paradigm, I think uh, the time has come for the World Bank and other multilateral agencies to, to resume uh, funding of large-scale projects. And I suppose that this is what one of this discussion is all about, to see areas of uh, operation in that regard. So under our administration, uh, since 2016, under the Bohamad Bar administration, we have developed a number of programs, uh, a national irrigation program for a 15-year program. Uh, we identifying more dams for hydropower potential and development. Uh, we have uh, developed a national water supply, sanitation and hygiene policy. And we have a new action plan for the strengthening and management of our river basin development authorities. We have 12 river basin development authorities across the country. Uh, and of course, these plans are, have the recommendations for critical projects for efficient development and management of the nation's water resources, including storage of flood control, floods, waters, irrigation, and hydropower. But unfortunately, many of these projects require a lot of financing and that is not uh, forthcoming. And uh, like I said, this one area that I think that requires our attention. Uh, so we need to continue to cooperate and support of development partners to reach our water resources management goals. Uh, as federal government, we own most of the large dams and uh, most of the Sahel areas, we have had quite a number of dams, but uh, we do need to invest more in the Benue Basin. You know, we have two main drainages, rivers Niger and Benue. River Niger and its tributaries, we have received, we have done quite a lot of damming, we have got reservoirs, but on the river Benue and its uh, uh, tributaries, a lot needs to be done. That is where a lot of the flood also is coming. So uh, we need uh, some improvement, some investment in that in that direction. And I'm happy to say that the World Bank has recently been supporting the government to undertake a policy dialogue on water security and water governance, which in turn will help to inform a national water security strategic framework for the country. And uh, we're working on a number of projects like Acresal and Trimin. Acresal is for watershed management, Trimin is for irrigation. And uh, at the end of the day, we hope to get an enhanced and effective integrated water resource management efforts in the country uh, to manage our water resources within acceptable levels of risks, to build resilience in water management systems against risks through optimized utilization of existing water storage, production, productive uses, and repurpose it towards preventing and protective risk reduction and adaptation, and finally, to strengthen the institutions that manage the systems fully consistent with Nigeria's legal and institutional framework. Uh, challenges, some of our reservoirs, mainly, I think, uh, due to watershed mismanagement, uh, we have a lot of river siltation, and that has contributed to a lot of flooding. And sometimes also the, uh, we have to open the reservoirs during high flood seasons. And that in itself, well, you know, the, the, the irony is that where the reservoirs mainly are supposed to store water and maybe control flood, but sometimes when we have excessive rainfalls well beyond our expectations, as has happened this year, we have to open all the gates, and then uh, there is a kind of unpredicted and uncontrolled flood downstream of the communities. Uh, and this is mainly because uh, most of our reservoirs, I think, their storage level has reduced because of our siltation and so on. And of course, I mentioned the challenge of groundwater, uh, of our exploitation of groundwater. We're not doing anything about recharging the groundwater except for the natural flow process, but the rate at which we are you know, extracting the water, I think, is a cause for concern going into the future. So thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to make a few remarks here. Now, thank you very much, Minister. And uh, we certainly will continue working on this. And the reason why we have a discussion today on sustainable water storage and river basin is because we believe, and as the report will also confirm this based on the study, is that without good storage, both surface water as well as groundwater, the point that was made by the Indian speaker, we are not going to be able to cope with the climate change. I think storage is going to be a very fundamental part of our capacity to deal with climate change and handling uh, droughts and floods. That's a good segue to the next speaker, uh, and we are very pleased to be joined by 
Honorable Minister Carlos Alberto Fortes Mesquita, Minister of Public Works of Mozambique. Uh, Mr. Minister, you are the Minister for Public Works, Housing and Water Resources in the Republic of Mozambique. And you've been the ministers in various capacities since uh, January 2015, Minister for Industry and Commerce, Minister for Transport and Communication. And you've also, of course, been involved in the various uh, high-level committees and boards uh, in, in your country. So, Mr. Minister, the floor is yours. And thank you very much, really, for joining from Mozambique. Well, thank you. Good morning for everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Allow me, on behalf of the government of Mozambique and on my own behalf, to express my gratitude for the invitation to participate in this important session with a team of great interest to my country. In Mozambique, we have been promoting discussions on implementing new approaches to investing in water resources for sustainable and integrated development in order to create resilience to the effects of climate change, which actually represents the aspirations to reduce poverty and promote sustainable development. For good order's sake, let me start with brief notes about Mozambique, which has 2,800 kilometers long coastline with more than 1,000 rivers, basins of which nine of the 15 countries' main rivers are transboundary, just to mention some as Rovuma, Zambezi, Buzi, and Umbeluzi. Approximately 50% of the water in Mozambique's rivers originates from upstream countries. In addition to that, to the geographical location and topographical features, Mozambique is vulnerable to extreme weather conditions. In recent years, floods, droughts, and tropical cyclones have occurred with an average of at least one event each year, causing hundreds of millions of US dollars in damages with a direct negative impact on the country's GDP. The country joined the Paris Agreement treat, adopted the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and has committed to take action to strengthen the ability to adapt to climate change and build resilience. But as the climate impacts are not limited to national borders, adaptation should be of a greater international concern. Let me express some experience and progress achieved in sector vision. Consolidate international cooperation. Mozambique established bilateral and multilateral forums with countries with which shares watersheds, signed water resources, sharing agreements, and established different transboundary institutions to ensure an integrated management of water resources. The goal is to consolidate the cooperation for water it is in a, fa a factor of cooperation, peace, and development and not the sort of conflict in the region. Increase in storage capacity. Mozambique currently has 16 dams with a unit capacity greater than 1.0 million cubic meters and a total storage capacity of 59.1 million cubic meters. However, around 90% of all storage capacity is concentrated in a single dam, the so-called Kaora Rasa Dam at the Zambezi River. Therefore, it is a priority the development of strategic hydraulic infrastructure for multiple uses. These infrastructures are included the construction of dams, small dams, and excavated reservoirs. On the issue of improving the monitoring network coverage, the knowledge we have about our rivers 
we dictate our readiness for extreme events. That's why we need to expand the rivers monitoring network, introduce modern technologies and increase the coverage and sequencing of measurements in water to achieve the optimal monitoring system. Developing management instruments, the country is proceeding with the development of plans and strategies for river basins, improving land use and giving space to water courses in potential flooding areas, including investment plans and promoting practice for managing the demand for water resources, both in urban and rural areas, considering efficient and sustainable use as well as resource conservation. Establish of efficient disaster prevention system. The goal on this is to graduate to gradually complete efficient disaster prevention systems in the thir 13 most vulnerable basins in the country, like Rovuma, Nugela, Mesalo, Orta Maritima, Likungu, Lurio, Zambez, Umwe, Buzi, Save, Limpopo, Incomate, Embeluzi, and Maputo. This includes the development and implementation of hydraulic models of floods and droughts for each basin, including early warning systems. On the investment opportunities in water storage infrastructure or challenges and prospects, I would like to mention the following. Storage is a key element for Mozambique's water security and resilient economic development. Mozambique has one of the largest hydropower potentials in sub-Saharan Africa, estimated at around 12,500 megawatts. Mr. Minister, Our could you wrap up, please? If you could wrap up, please. Sorry? If you could wrap up kindly, please. Okay. From large seasonal and regional variations, in water availability, despite these countries as one of the lowest storage capacities uh, of renewable water in the world, with only 0 0.3 of 216 billion meter cubic, cubic meters of water that in average across the country during the year. Well, this scenario makes our priority the construction of multiple post dams. That's why we would like to underline the stress of use of the reservoir of water to ensure water security. The government of Mozambique would like to commend this presentation or, or this invitation from a World Bank in order to present our ideas, initiatives to minimize the problem that runs along the country. We are also following the regulation on safety and dams in Mozambique which incorporates good international industry practice approved by the Council of Ministers, which we have also placed as a law in Mozambique. In terms of groundwater monitoring, the country's network composed of 67 observation points under the management of government, which provides quite clear information and data to monitor also the regional cooperation with our neighboring countries like Zimbabwe, Iswatini, and South Africa. We recognize the support of the World, World Bank on this agenda for several several years, most notably with the rehabilitation of Coromana Dam. The, region, uh, the Regional Climate Resilience Program offers, offers a regional platform that will raise Africa's voice on climate adaptation, strengthening government regional systems for climate resilience and attract more climate financing. As some final remarks from my side, I would like to underline that we are committed to reduce the emission of harmful substances and create climate resilience. As a proof of this, the Maputo Declaration, recently signed by Southern African leaders for the protection and conservation of Miombo forest ecosystems in the region, with focus on the Zambezi River Basin. Finally, I would like to highlight the importance of this conference, which addresses the challenges of many managing water resources, access water, and sanitation that will still persist, that still persists in the, our country. 
and where gender is equally and inclusion issues should be deserved increased attention since we have women and children traveling long distance for water still. Thank you very much. I could, not end, my speech, my, I could not end my speech without praising the great contribution of the various organizations present and absent in this forum. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. I'm sorry I had to rush you. I have three speakers left and we have only a few minutes left. So I really apologize for not managing the time so well. Each of the presentations have been so interesting that I really feel bad to cut you off. So my request to the next three speakers will be to really be brief, not more than a minute each. And if you could just convey three key messages to this audience. So first I will go to Christina, who's the general manager of the Bogota Water and Severance Company. And thank you very much for connecting so early in the morning from there. Christina, the floor is yours. And please try to be in one minute if you can. Okay, I'll, I'll try to do it. Can you hear me, everyone? Yes, we can hear you very well, Christina. Well, thank you very much. So I had a presentation. I'm not sure if it's going to be uploaded, but I'll start. We manage basically 21 cubic meters per second uh, to supply water for around 10 million people, which is a different level that the earlier speakers spoke of. Um, and basically, we, we face the same challenges that the other ones, and it's climate change. So how are we uh, um, handling this and how are we preparing for this? Basically, it leads through, through three strategies, addressing climate-related risk, strengthening green infrastructure, and we're transitioning to a more circular model. Uh, so, in the first term, I would like to say that we are a carbon neutral um, company, uh, the only one in the country of this uh, that handles water. But we also monitor water in the upstream by using bio indicators that are sensitive to climate um, alteration, uh, alterations such as uh, algae and fish. Uh, so we are using this type of um, indicators to, to monitor how are we doing. Also, we are strengthening our green infrastructure. Basically, we own around 33,000 hectares uh, that are destined only for protection. Um, we are the owners and we protect them. Uh, and each year we try to buy more land only for protection in the catchment areas. Um, additionally, we are, have a restoration plan uh, for the long term uh, to, to know exactly what we should do in each of the areas that, that we buy. And in terms of the circular model, basically we are already recirculating around uh, 850 cubic meters per day in our smallest plant. plant. And we are uh, going to be recirculating around 4.5 cubic meters per second um, in the next year with some optimizations that we're making on our largest plant. Another issue that is important for us um, is uh, water losses. And basically, it's a big challenge. In the Latin America, we, we account around 43% of water losses. We are in Bogota around 35.8% uh, in losses, uh, but going down for the first time since uh, 2017. Uh, after COVID, it was really hard to handle water losses, but now we are on the good track uh, and that's a big issue uh, for us. So uh, just to close up, uh, basically, we are privileged in Bogota in terms of water availability, but we are investing significantly in protecting water resources, adapting our operations to existing and upcoming risks, and become more efficient, efficient through different uh, strategies to manage potential water scarcity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christina. And I really apologize for having to rush you off. So we have two more speakers, and uh, I think they both deserve at least uh, two minutes each. First, I'll go to you, Mr. Rajinder Singh, who is also known as the Waterman of India. 
winner of the Stockholm Prize 2015, which is the Nobel Prize for Water. And of course, he's been working with communities around the world. So two minutes for you, and then I'll turn to Johan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you know that India have a wisdom for uh, drought and flood treatment. But that is only possible when the government and pupil and community jointly explore the solution and explore the way. My experience is last 42 years in India when the community take the responsibility for the treatment of uh, solution of the drought and flood. So they saw the path of this world. More than 10,600 square kilometer area in last 42 years, only, only the community action. No take a single pie from your World Bank or no take a single pie from any government. Only co community show the experience for this world where the, uh, I'm speaking in last uh, 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 more than 2,500 uh, 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 years before, Raja Janak, when the facing the drought. So he started the work with the uh, civil society and he gave the solution. After that, the Dwapar, Krishna, Bhagwan, taking the animal husbandry, cows, uh, pupils, and give the solution of the flood. So when the kingdom or when, when the pupil join hand, they can give the solution of the drought and flood. I know in the history of uh, drought and flood everywhere, and now the Europe is facing uh, drought and flood. So the solution is not only technology and engineering or not only money. The solution is in the heart and brain of the community and pupil and the commitment of the politics. The politics commitment not for the better common future. I am saying in 2009, first time, the water is climate and climate is water. And after that, why I am saying, because my area is the Rensado region. And when the water conservation starts, and due to the greenery, the micro clouds come and giving the good rains. So if we are really bother about the better common future, the only way the money is not important. The important is commitment of politics and the mobilization of the people. When they join hand, they can give the solution. My country is the great solution more than 10,600 square kilometer area you can see in last 42 years. Uh, no drought, no flood. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Adnan Singh Ji. And, and we thank you for your work, the work you've done mobilizing people in India, and now you're working in many other countries in the world. And World Bank also is very committed to working with people. Uh, that's very much part of our policy. But I agree with you, the political will to really transform the water sector is very important. Last but not the least, we have uh, Professor Johan Rockstrom, who is the co-chair of the Global Commission on the Economics of Water. Perhaps he's one of the most popular names these days on the issue of sustainability globally. And with that, I will turn to you, uh, Professor, for your last word. The topic of the today's session, the first session of the Water Day here is sustainable water storage, a new paradigm for managing climate change. Over to you, Professor. Yes, thanks. And, and, and a new paradigm is, is definitely needed. Let me just uh, scientifically support my friend here that, yes, we've had natural variability of water for thousands of years. But the latest science shows that now we're outside of the natural variability of the last 2000 years. Every one degree Celsius of warming caused by our fossil fuel burning adds 7% more moisture to the atmosphere, causing even more of the extremes that minister from Nigeria was explaining here. So we are truly outside of a safe space. Water is a victim, but water is also a driver of change. Water is the bloodstream. If you look at it carefully, you have some five to 6,000 cubic meters of fresh water behind every ton of carbon that is sequestered in the earth system as a buffer 
for cooling the planet. But my key point here before coming to the uh, Economics Commission is that we now have ample science that on the storage and on the surface runoff and even on green water, the moisture flow that powers all the biomass production, all the rainfed farming, we are outside of the sustainable limits and that we can today quantify scientifically what is the safe space. Now, if you do those quantifications, that translates to scarcities. Scarcities need to be shared in a fair way among all citizens in the world. That is economics. As soon as a resource is scarce, you have to put an economic value to be able to use it in an efficient way. So the Global Water Economics Commission is an attempt in a trilogy. We started with a stern review on the economics of climate. We then took the Parthadas Gupta review, the phenomenal work on the economics of biodiversity. And now we are launching or launching in the midst of the work of the third, namely the economics of water. What are we trying to do here? Well, we're trying to calculate the cost of inaction on water, the damage for food insecurity, unhealth, but also undermining the resilience in the carbon sinks in the earth system, but also looking at the benefits of action. So this will be something that we present at the UN Water Summit in March of 2023, but then continuing to work throughout 2023 to finalize in 2024. And just to close by saying that we have rivers on planet Earth, but we also have rivers in the atmosphere. And just remember that what we're doing with climate change is actually changing the rivers also in the atmosphere. Did you know that 80%, 80 percent, eight zero percent of rainfall in large parts of southeastern China and large parts of southern Africa and large parts of southern parts of South America comes from green water evaporation flows from upwind functioning healthy forests, which means that we have a geopolitical interconnection on water through the rivers that flow in the atmosphere. Let's be sure that we get water at the center of the climate transition because it regulates everything, because everything ultimately starts with rainfall. Thank you very much. So you said it all. Let's put water at the center of the climate transition. Let's give a big round of applause to all the speakers, especially our speakers who connected online from India, Mexico, and uh, Colombia. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank mm -hmm. you.